A ton of stories that revolve around monsters aim to put them in the ground, or remove their curse, or at the very least, avoid their gaze. So it's important to understand how each creature you include in a story actually works. Which leads us to the big question, how do you make a monster? The first step to creating a monster is to understand why it's needed at all. Will this creature be your primary antagonist, a brief obstacle to overcome, or are they the protagonist? It's 2022. Monsters can be the good guys now. Understanding the creature's role in the story can help you understand how to write and describe them. John Krasinski had a very clear concept for this with his monsters in A Quiet Place. He said that he was really interested in the idea of introducing them as a new predator or parasite into Earth's existing ecosystems and how they might disrupt life. Everything about their design and presentation played into that role as an invasive species. Let's turn for a moment, though, to one of the classic monsters. Werewolves have historically been viewed as people cursed for terrible deeds or by scorned lovers or people who wore magical pelts that could transform into wolves. Then, for a few centuries, people were convinced that real werewolves were hunting people around Europe. Then in 1941, we got the Wolfman. This version of the story was meant to more or less reinvent the creature's image for Hollywood, no doubt taking cues from some of the other major monster flicks of the time. In the end, this version of the werewolf told the story in a new way, as a tragedy. The monsters in a quiet place were meant to be feral, invasive hunters. The wolfman's titular werewolf was designed to be a sympathetic figure. But what about your monsters? Figuring out an answer to this question of the creature's purpose is huge. After all, it's important to understand what you're making in order to do it well. It doesn't even have to be a complex purpose to be entertaining, just so long as it makes sense in the context of the story. Netflix's The Witcher spends a lot of time and effort on its monsters, but in season one, they never stuck around too long before being shown the edge of a silver sword. That's not wrong. In a show like The Witcher, you need to show the monster hunter taking down a few monsters. But in season two, they didn't just introduce new things for Geralt to fight. They added a whole new layer of depth and played into The Witcher's role as a hunter, not just a killer. There are a few more monsters, and they're really unexpected monsters. That's part of Geralt's mystery this season, is trying to figure out exactly where these monsters are coming from and why they are different. Next, we need to understand the creature's strengths and weaknesses. This is probably the most obvious part of the whole process, but it's still important. The story may be told quite differently if your creatures can burrow, read minds, or transform. Similarly, their weaknesses may influence the plot. In I Am Legend, Robert tries to understand the vampires around him, taking books from the library and even going so far as to capture vampires to test his theories. Not only is this a fun period of discovery in the story, but it's also what pulls Robert out of his initial depression about the end of the world, more or less. How do you decide the strengths and weaknesses of your creatures, though? Well, that's the fun part. If it has wings, it can probably fly, and it might be vulnerable on the ground. If it's got big teeth, it could have a nasty bite, but it might be sensitive to blunt force. You know, like how if a shark's after you and you can't get away, you gotta try hitting it in the nose. It's not quite the same, but you get the idea. And if you're working with a classic monster, you have a ton of references to branch off from. If you're writing about vampires, check out Bram Stoker's Dracula. Or for werewolves, read Sabine Baring Gold's aptly titled The Book of Werewolves. But don't limit yourself to just the classic literature. You can invent so many cool concepts by just saying, it's a werewolf, but I don't know, they're empowered by the sun. You know, one simple change like that can have huge effects. Once you understand what purpose the creature fills and how it ticks, it's probably time to decide how to present them on the page. Jumping back to A Quiet Place, Krasinski told Empire, The first movie, um, I gave very little information about where these creatures came from, what was going on, um, how this all happened. And I did that very purposefully. And the reason why was I thought it would be much more tense um, and you would be living with the characters, figuring out what's going on as they are figuring it out. And I thought if I gave you all the information, you somehow would disconnect from the characters because you'd say, come on, this is what happened. Why aren't you getting it? You're, you're taking too long to get it. 
This is a fantastic example of Ernest Hemingway's iceberg theory at work. It's a writing technique that focuses on showing just the most important surface level part of the story. Everything else is still there, it just lives in the subtext. It's submerged, if you will. How much you do or don't use this technique will affect the mood of the story. After all, the monsters in the shadows are often scarier than those we can see. It's important that you, as the author, understand the context and goals for your monsters. Even if the reader never gets the full story, it's important that you know where your creature came from and what its motives are, what its strengths and weaknesses are. That way, the details you do reveal will make sense together and your readers can piece together the subtext. A creature might be a temporary obstacle, comic relief, an ally, or it might just look badass in the moment. Whatever you decide, the important thing is that you give the creature a purpose. Look at the creature's physiology, psychology, and if it has any, origin stories to help you decide its strengths and weaknesses. Don't just feel like you have to adhere to the classic myths completely. Play with them a bit. The only limit is what you can get your audience to believe in. Finally, understanding what to show and what to hide is a big part of how you present monsters to people, especially in the suspense and horror stories where they so often live. Try hiding, obscuring, or having your characters misinterpret information around the monsters. Thanks for watching.